Well, as I said, this is probably the most unusual Christmas, New Year's message you will, probably will ever have heard. And it, the, the title is something to make some Baptists probably rejoice. Born to be rejected and chosen to rule and reign. They probably get a real thrill out of, oh, that idea, you know, eternal security and predestination and that sort of thing. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> In 2003, Michael Lewis wrote a book called Moneyball, How to Win an Unfair Game. They subsequently made a movie out of that. He tells the story of Billy Dean, who was the general manager of the Oakland Athletics baseball team. It all started with three of the Oakland best players leaving for bigger and better teams. More money. The Athletics were a small market team and compared to the wealthy Yankees and Red Sox. Dean faced another problem, which was a limited budget on how much the Oakland franchise was allowed to spend for ball players. Bean went to Cleveland to recruit some players when he inadvertently met up with a fellow named Peter Brand, who was a Yale <coughs> economics graduate. In their conversation, Brand advised him to use a different set of techniques to pick players, which is called Saber Metrics. It's a system of picking talented players who are undervalued. Some of these undervalued players are on the verge of losing their careers to younger and healthier players. Bean hired Brand as an assistant general manager as they start recruiting baseball players. Billy Bean was himself a failed former major league player. Now in a leadership role, he is able to give other players without star talent a new lease on life. He moves the injured to different positions where they still have remaining skills and talent to be able to play. And I might point out in a parenthesis here, one of them was a well-known catcher who had injured himself and no longer was able to uh, work effectively as a catcher. And Billy Bean chose him and picked him and put him at first base. And he excelled beyond some of the other first basemen in the same league. He was just a top-notch first baseman, but he couldn't be a good <coughs> catcher anymore. And they thought, well, if he's not a good catcher, get rid of him. And that's what his team thought, and Billy Bean picked him. Bean's team of lesser-known, undervalued rejects set new records in winning. They had a winning streak that had never been seen in baseball before because of these rejects. Dean's risks paid off, and now he is celebrated for having changed the game of baseball using this different type of means of choosing. A minister friend of mine said, there is no need greater than the need to be needed. So I ask, do you feel ne needed or neglected? Do you feel accepted or ignored in your family, in your church, in your community? Do you feel marginalized? Do you ever ask yourself, what's the use and what is my purpose? How can you know that you are important? How can you know that you have a reason for being? In looking at scriptures concerning this time of year, Luke chapter 2, verse 6. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Why? Because there was no room for them in the inn. Rejected from a place with warm water. <laughs> to go out to be in a place of cold water. And here, the Son of God was born, rejected by the townspeople. John chapter 1, verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 
And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but the will of God, born into that family. And he says to you and me, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, but to give you a future and a hope. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. How hard is that to remember? How many times have we seen it, heard it, spoke it ourselves? Not pause to think about what's being said. Some evangelists and ministers encourage us to change the words of that verse to have a personal application. They tell us to change the word world to your own personal name and requote that famous scripture personally. But let me have you do that. You say your name. Don't worry about somebody else. Just you say your name. For God Almighty so loved that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to die for, say, so that should not perish, but have everlasting life. Making that change is a legitimate application of the teachings of Scripture and the purpose, the purpose of the gospel message. The gospel is a personal message. It's an individual message for each one of us. A personal God sent his own son to save us personally. He who made you and me sent his only son to make our take our punishment for sin to redeem us to himself. Why? So he could have a personal relationship with each one of us. He did it all and we reap the rewards. All we need do is receive that gift, open it and keep it personally as yours. I can buy and wrap a thousand gifts for my family. Now, I don't wrap them. The boss wraps them. <laughs> but it does my family no good whatsoever till they receive that gift and open it as theirs. It's God's gift to us through his son is the gift of eternal life with him. God chose you because he loves you individually, without exception. God loves each one of us one on one. He has the ability to love us with all that he has, every one of us. Jesus wanted us to know how important each one of us is to God with the story of the shepherds seeking the lost sheep. Out away from the flock was one sheep lost alone, helpless and hopeless. The good shepherd leaves the flock in a safe place and goes out to retrieve that one. Those that are left safe know the shepherd did the same thing for each one of them. The message is God the Father loves to connect with those who are lost and alone, the rejects of life who need someone to tell them that they are worth it. Jeremiah 20 and 11, 29 11 has become our go-to verse 
For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Just like the baseball manager moving players to different positions where they can still shine, Jesus can do extraordinary things through ordinary people. It isn't how greatly you are able to do things. We serve a great God who can do anything. Amen. You are not alone. Where there is depression, there is usually rejection. The need for love, acceptance, and self-worth is one of the strongest needs of our nature. Amen. Jesus was disregarded at his birth. Luke 2, 7, And she brought forth her firstborn, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. John 1, 11, He came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him... To them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. God was rejected. God was rejected by the angels in heaven. When God created all things in Genesis chapter 1, God said it was good. A Hebrew word that means pleasurable, pleasant, and beautiful. Ezekiel 28 verse 12, we find a description of Satan at his beginnings. Perfect in all respects the leader of the sons of the morning, which commentators tell us he was the choir leader in heaven. But Isaiah chapter 14 tells us that mysteriously sin was birthed in Satan's heart and he rebelled and fell from his lofty position. And consequently, there was a war in heaven and Satan rebelling against God, trying to displace God, became the enemy of God. And Satan in his rebellion drugged down one third of the angels that were in heaven with him. Revelation 12, 4 and verse 9 tell us he brought down a third of the stars. Jude chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Those angels who followed Satan left their first dwelling place, their first estate, it says in one uh, version. They once had positions of authority. They once were in positions of service to God, but now they are confined in chains of darkness till the day when everyone who has rejected God will be judged. Matthew 25, 41 and Revelation 20, verse 10. The great white throne judgment. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. It wasn't made for man. You're not invited. Neither are those whom we pray for that they receive Christ as Savior. Hell wasn't made for them. It was made for the devil. They ought not want to go. You're not invited. Get right with God and go to the place he wants you to go to. Lot was rejected. Genesis 19, 9, when he warned the people of Sodom about their evil actions, they said, who made you judge over us? Joseph was rejected by his brothers in Genesis 37, 18. They said, here comes that dreamer. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into the pits. Then when we will see what becomes of his dreams. But the elder, Reuben, said, ah, let's not kill him. So they sold him to slave traders. Moses was rejected by his wife in Ezekiel chapter 4. Believe me, this is one of the strangest passages you will ever read. Chapter 4, verses 24, 25, and 26. You better put on your seatbelt because you'll fall out of your chair reading these things. God showed up to kill Moses because he hadn't circumcised his sons. And so she did the circumcision. And she screamed at him, you're just a bloody man to me. And the people rejected him. In Numbers chapter 14, they got fed up with Moses and cried out, let's pick another leader and go back to Egypt. Oh, well, that's a wonderful place to go. They're taking your children and throwing them to the alligators. You're you're making bricks with no straw and you're eating junk. That's a real smart move. Samuel was rejected by the nation of Israel when they wanted a king and he came to God all dejected and ashamed and he he, he cried out to God, what's going on? And God says, they have not rejected you, they've rejected me that I should rule over them. Go ahead and do what they ask. Job was rejected by his wife. She scoffed at him and says, do you still cling to your integrity? Curse God and die. Job was rejected by his friends. He insisted on his innocence, but they argued, if you're so innocent, how come you have so many problems? 
You're serving Jesus? You're serving that God over there? Are you still hanging on to all that stuff? <laughs> Look at all the problems you got. This is the first historic record that we have of this philosophical claim that if you were good, you wouldn't have any problems. That's what the world is teaching today. In Job's defense, he has comes back with the question of why do bad things happen to good people? It's because the devil hates you. You were made in God's image and you are destined to rule with God over angels. And Satan hates you because he tried to do that himself. He wanted that for himself and God is giving it to you. Giving it as a gift. God spoke to Job in the final four chapters and instead of answering Job's questions, God turned around and asked Job 77 unanswerable questions about the universe, creation, and the wonders of nature. So don't be surprised if when you ask God why, He doesn't answer why. Sometimes you really don't need to know why. You just need somebody there to listen. And the best thing you can do is what Job's friends did do the first week they came. They came. They cried with him. And sometimes that's the best ministry you can do for somebody that's hurting. Just sit there and cry with them. I don't know if you... You probably don't know this story. Dick Van Dyke, his life came to an end. He wasn't wanted by Hollywood. He wasn't wanted by his families. He ended up almost homeless. Completely ruined. Sitting on a park bench in New York City... A little girl about 10 years old, just as cute as a button, sat down next to Dick Van Dyke. And he just kind of glanced over at her, and she started rocking back and forth. Let's go fly a kite up highest heights. And sang that song, and he joined her. And his whole life was turned around by that sweet little girl reminding him that life was worth living. And he still credits her to this day of saving his life. David, the shepherd boy, was rejected by his brothers when Israel faced Goliath. First Samuel 17, they said, his brother said to him, what are you doing coming down here anyway? Who is taking care of the sheep that you're supposed to be watching after, you little booger? I know your pride of deceit. You wanted to watch a battle. Oh, we saw through you. A little paraphrase there for a minute. That other word's not in the Bible. Okay. David, was, as king, was rejected by his son Absalom and some of his other family. He attempted to take... Absalom tried to take the kingdom by deceit and treachery. Absalom would try to steal the hearts of the people. He sat at the gate of judgment seat. And he told everybody to camp, Oh, if I were just a judge in Israel, I would give you justice. Jeremiah was rejected by King Zedekiah, so much so that he threw him into a mud pit. And he was rejected by the other prophets who called him a liar. And then he was rejected by the people who wanted to kill him. But God came to Jeremiah in chapter 39 and says, I will save you. You will not fall by the sword, but you will escape with your life because you trust in me, declares the Lord. And in chapter 45, verse 5, God said, You will not be harmed. I will give you your life as a reward wherever you go. Jeremiah, according to the traditions, died an old man, a leader, wherever he was. Mary was rejected by Joseph. When he found out she was pregnant, he's going to get rid of her. Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, Gabriel spoke to Joseph in a dream, and he says, no, 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 no. You take Mary as your wife, because that child is the child that she has received from God Jehovah. Jesus was rejected many times by the people, by the Pharisees, by disciples. He was rejected by the Pharisees. He says, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one Father and God. That's the English Standard Version. I bet you didn't know that. They considered Jesus to be an illegitimate child. Did you know that? And they threw it in his face. I have come in my Father's name, and you did not receive me. 
But another one will come in his own name, and he you will receive. You know who that he's talking about? He's talking about the Antichrist. Jesus was rejected by his followers in John chapter 6, verse 66. He said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you cannot follow me. And they, they walked away. He says, this is too hard to understand. And they quit. And he spun on his heel and stared at his disciples. And, you going to leave too? Peter spoke up and says, well, where are we going to go to find truth? You're the only one that speaks it. He was rejected by the Israelites. It says about the covenant people, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That verse comes out of Psalm 118, and it is the most repeated phrase in all of the Old Testament found in the New Testament. That statement that Jesus was rejected by his own people, but he has become the chief cornerstone. Jesus was rejected by people that he came to rescue. The, the demonic of Gadara, he cast the demons out. The people were terrified with this guy that was strong, able to break chains and run around. They thought he would rip people to shreds, and he could. And when the demons were cast out of him, the people showed up to thank Jesus. Oh, what a wonderful thing you did. No, they told him, would you please leave? Oh, thank you very much. He was rejected when he started his ministry. The people complained. Hey, ain't this the carpenter's son? Ain't this Joseph's boy? We saw him grow up. What makes him so special? But Jesus pre predicted his rejection in Mark chapter 8. He said it's necessary for the Son of Man to be rejected by the elders and the scribes and to be killed. And the church, the church, the church rejects Jesus in the last days. We are living in the last days right now. And Jesus is being rejected by churches all over this world. How? The Laodicean church doesn't need anything. Rich prosperous, powerful, popular. And Jesus is on the outside knocking on the door wanting admittance. And it tells us this in the book of Revelation chapter 3. And as the painting, if you've ever seen the painting of Jesus knocking on the door, there's no doorknob, no door handle. It's on the inside. The people on the inside have to open the door in order to let him in. And he's knocking on the door and he says, those that will open the door I will come into them and sup with them and they with me you're familiar with that that is not to sinners that is not to sinners it's to saints it's to his church that has shut him out and God help us individually that we never shut him out of our lives or out of the church where we worship him Paul was rejected by the Jews he finally, he told them, your blood be on your own heads. God the Father rejected. Revelation chapter 16, verse 9. The people suffering many torments and punishments during the great tribulation turn on God and blame Him for their problems. In Romans chapter 1, verse 28, the rejection of God is seen they reject the very thought of God and His existence. Then God gives them over to a reprobate mind, leaving them to the destructive consequences of their own choices. And that's where we are living at now. But, but, God has chosen you. He has chosen to redeem us. In Hebrews chapter 2, I will just tell you what this says. It uses a Greek word that is epilumbano. And it says that Jesus did not epilumbano the angels that fell. But he did epilumbano fallen man, you and I. And that word means in the Greek a long statement. And here's the statement. With compassion and mercy he reached down to get a hold of us and lift us up and redeem us and save us and put us on solid footing. He did not do that with angels, but He did that with you and me. He reached down to rescue each and every one of us. God is a father to the fatherless, and He is a husband to the widow. Psalm 68. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise 
those that are captive. Psalm 69. In Luke chapter 10, whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects him also who sent me. God chose Noah. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God chose Joseph even when he was in the pit. The words of the book of Genesis chapter 37 says God was with Joseph in the pit. He never rejected Joseph. God chose Samuel and caused him to be the first prophet of the nation. God chose Jeremiah and made him the prophet, the weeping prophet to the people. And he says in chapter 1 verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and chose you to be my prophet. God chose Isaiah in chapter 6. When Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips, the angel came down and touched his lips and said, Now your lips are pure. And when he heard God say, Who will go for us? Isaiah said, I will go. And God chose Isaiah to be his spokesman, to go to the people and present his message. Jesus, in Mark chapter 3, went out and prayed all night. And early the next morning, when he came back from having prayed in the mountain all night, he chose 12 to be with him. And that word in the Greek is the most astonishing word you will ever run across concerning a personal relationship with another individual when a husband and a wife are looking face to face, intimately, lovingly, caringly, dreamily. That's the word with. And it's the statement that is made concerning Jesus himself that when he was in heaven before he came to earth, he was with the Father. Adoringly, lovingly, intimately, individually. As if nobody else in the world existed but the two of you. That's how God looks at you. God chose Paul and said, He is my chosen vessel and I have told him many things he must suffer for my name's sake. God chose you and me. John chapter 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and that wherever, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Is there a witness that's left behind because of Norm? Amen. Is there a witness that's left behind because of Richard? Amen. Because of Denny? Amen. Because of Ray. Amen. 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 Their life left a witness and a message that still rings throughout this world. The testimony of their love. And that is why it says in Hebrews, we have such a great cloud of witnesses that is telling us, keep it up. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep it up. It's worth it. It's worth it. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 6, right in the middle, it says, Even before He made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His, in His eyes. And at the end, so we praise God for the glorious grace that He has poured out on us who belong to His dear Son. 1 Peter 2 But you are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. That's who you are, that you might proclaim his praises. Verse 10, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, Why did God choose me? Because of his great love, mercy, and grace. His love is why he has chosen us. His grace is how he chose us. And Jesus is the source of the authority that he has to choose us. Ephesians 2, 4 and 9, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. Remember picking teams in PE, the tallest, the fastest, the most athletic, the most popular? 
God doesn't use that. His criteria for choosing people is not based on us. Paul explains why God chose us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Considering your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards, and not many of you were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world. God chose what is weak in the world. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God, and because of him you are in Christ Jesus. Why did God choose you and me? He chose us to demonstrate his character. He chose you that you might know him and love him. He chose you because he's love. He is gracious, he is merciful. And he has a plan for you. He has a glorious future for you that will be ruling and reigning by his side for all eternity. And that's why he came. So he could choose you to be his own. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he lift up his presence upon you and give you peace. May you not doubt for one minute his precious choice of you to be his very own, both now and throughout eternity, to his glory. Amen and amen. God bless you, everybody.